Growing up in Slovenia, snow used to be a common occurrence in winters. These days, it tends to stay on the ground for a few days at best, or appear in the middle of April. There also appear to be more occurrences of hail and floods, as well as a higher frequency of very hot summer days. Global warming is widely, widely recognized as a major threat to humanity. The International Panel on Climate Change has warned that we have only a few years left to radically decarbonize the economy if disastrous global warming is to be avoided. In other words, we have to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. Now, climate change and other environmental problems do not observe national borders and to manage them, a timely um, collective action is required. In that respect, climate change is similar to the pandemic we are currently experiencing, but it occurs over a much longer period of time gradually and thus appears to be less imminent. However, the consequences are much graver. The World leaders have recently called for a new global settlement to help the world fight future pandemics. Nobody is safe until everyone is safe. And with climate change, the only question is uh, when the future pandemics will occur, not if. In the area of climate change, the um, adoption of the Paris Agreement in 2015 was a major milestone in history. The overarching aim of the Paris Agreement is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to keep the global temperature increase well below the two degrees Celsius uh, relative to the pre-industrial levels and ideally pursuing a scenario where those global temperature increases in this century are kept below one and a half degrees Celsius. Under the agreement, uh, parties need to uh, submit their commitments to the objectives of the Paris Agreement in a formal submission to the United Nations. Those uh, nationally determined contributions, or NDCs for short, include all efforts to reduce national emissions and adapt to the impact of the climate, of the changing climate. Um, Unfortunately, the reductions and emissions submitted thus far fall short of what is required. Now, first, the good news is that most of the countries have committed to reducing their greenhouse gas emissions per unit of GDP. However, what is required are reductions in absolute greenhouse gas emissions. And the planned reductions in greenhouse gas emissions per unit of GDP are not sufficient to offset pollution associated with expected GDP growth. The chart on the screen shows that, that in um, countries in uh, Europe, Central Asia, Middle East and North Africa, NDC commitments mostly indicate an increase in greenhouse gas emissions between 2010 and 2030, in some instances of over 150%. In only 13 economies among those on the screen, do the NDC commitments indicate a decrease in greenhouse gas emissions in the same period? And those decreases range from 0.5% in Lithuania to a quarter in Cyprus. That's quite an order of magnitude smaller than the, in uh, the, than the increases indicated by the NDC commitments in other economies. And this reflects a fairly unamb unambitious nature of the emission reduction targets in NDCs, at least as far as absolute emissions reductions is concerned. At the aggregate level, the NDC commitments imply a reduction in absolute greenhouse gas emissions in advanced economies and an increase in greenhouse gas emissions in emerging and developing market economies. 
This is in line with the common uh, but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities principles under which advanced economies, which are responsible for most of the greenhouse gases currently in the atmosphere, are expected to not only reduce their own emissions, but also to provide support to developing and emerging economies to reduce theirs. However, much more drastic action will be required. Globally, greenhouse gas emissions have increased by 1.5% per year in the last decade. Um, in the second round of NDCs, which have been trickling in since 2020, um, a threefold increase in commitments and ambitions will be required to achieve the two degrees Celsius goal, and a more than fivefold increase um, will be required to achieve the one and a half degrees Celsius goal. Another way to assess the performance of economies um, in their transition to a green economy is to look at green laws and policies implemented to reduce emissions. The number of green laws and policies have increased sub substantially since 1990s in all countries. Most of these laws and policies are regulatory in nature. They introduce, for example, em emission standards. Early on, most of these policies were information and agreement based, but over time, policies involving or introducing taxes and levies have gained traction. Now, this indicates that voluntary agreements might not work quite as well as we would like them to, and we need some carrots and possibly sticks if we want to really achieve a reduction in emissions. Indeed, what matters is not the number of laws and policies, but their enforcement. Estimates suggest that green laws and policies have um, decreased CO2 emissions in Europe, Central Asia and Middle East by 12% between 1997 and 2016 compared to what they would have been otherwise. This is encouraging, but it is not enough much more will be required to accelerate the transition to a green economy. Transition to a green economy requires massive corporate investments in cleaner technologies that will reduce the company's footprints. Um, against this background, several large companies such as Apple, BP and British Airways have recently announced their goals of climate neutrality by 2050 at the latest. However, not all companies, especially the smaller ones, are able or willing to invest in cleaner technologies. Using data from the latest round of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, European Investment Bank and World Bank Enterprise Surveys, we show that uh, companies differ wi widely in their ability to access bank loans, as well as the quality of green management practices. Now, by green management practices, I mean, do they have strategic objectives that mention climate change and um, environmental issues? Do they have a manager that is in charge of such uh, issues? Do they monitor their energy usage and their emission of pollutants? Um, and do they have any targets related to such um, energy usage or pollutant emissions? Now, the inability of firms to borrow as much as they would like reduces the likelihood of um, investment in green uh, types of investments, especially those that require higher investment amounts, such as machinery and vehicle upgrades, improved heating, cooling or lighting, and green energy generation on site. Credit constraints do not really reduce the likelihood of investment in other types of green investments, such as air pollution and other controls or energy efficiency, possibly due to the um, relatively low hanging fruit nature of such investments. Firms that have good management practices, on the other hand, are more likely to invest in all types of green uh, investments, as shown on the screen. Um, but the effect is larger for those types of investments that we are more typically likely to think of as green, such as waste and recycling, energy and water management, air and other pollution controls, and energy efficiency measures. Now, interestingly, 
uh, firm managers that have themselves experienced extreme weather events are more concerned about climate change and the environment. And as a result, their companies tend to have better green management practices. Now, financial and managerial constraints matter for green investments, but do they matter for the ultimate goal of reducing emissions? Well, we show that even though overall uh, air pollution emissions have decreased between 2007 and 2017, they have decreased by less in localities where banks had to deleverage more in the wake of the global financial crisis and where firms were thus more likely to be credit constrained. So it does matter for the ultimate goal as well. The scale and urgency of what will be required over the next 30 years will pose unprecedented challenges for the state. It requires determined political leadership, good public policy and strong state institutions. Now, this is not central planning 2.0. It, it means steering private direction, uh, private initiative in the right direction. Now, while there are private sector initiatives uh, in this area, and uh, several companies have announced their own voluntary emission targets in the last few years, there are no clear standards for calculating a company's carbon footprint. And that's where the role of the state comes in. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown just how vulnerable the global economic system is to system-wide risks. But it has also shown that the governments, the state, can act and can take drastic measures when faced with unprecedented challenges. Now, green transition is urgent, even as governments prioritize public health and battle the economic fallout from the pandemic. In the short run, the governments need to build transition to a green economy into COVID-19 recovery plans. And the good news is that the type of things that is required for green transition, such as um, clean uh, uh, investment in clean infrastructure or in energy efficiency, are also well suited to um, Act to help with the recovery plans because they create jobs. In the medium term, the state needs to eliminate or reduce the market and policy failures that impede the transition to a green economy. The key here is to get the prices right. This means a higher price on carbon and then applying this higher carbon price on a wider range of emission sources. It also requires elimination of fossil fuel subsidies. In the longer term, the state needs to support the creative destruction that transition to a green economy will unleash. We know that the benefits to the society from clean innovation are much, much higher than the benefits to the company engaging in that clean innovation. So this justifies additional government support for this type of innovation. At the same time, active policies aimed at seizing the opportunities presented by transition to a green economy will need to guard against the common pitfalls of in, uh, industrial policy, um, such as uh, capture by co politically connected interests. Last but not least, the state will need to support the workers and communities adversely affected by green transition. It has a duty to make sure that the transition process is equitable. To conclude, the transition to a green economy will not be easy. It has its challenges, but it is the only way to go. Thank you very much for your attention.